I greet you in the, in the name of Jesus Christ, and my name is Israel, and today I'm doing Spark Part 19. Um, I'm doing these videos as a, um, a, um, as a, a expression of uh, my life, and my life is a testimony. <clears throat> And so I'm um, just voicing out all the experiences I had in my life and the events that took place. So now I'm staying, I just moved from uh, the flat in Milneton. It was a one bedroom flat with an open plan lounge and kitchen and a small bathroom uh, I think it was on the second floor I don't remember meticulous details and um, I had a big view of Table Mountain because the one the in the lounge the whole space was full of glass windows a glass door and it was just an, an amazing picture frame of the the live table mountain and the scenery that was outside my home. But um, it was a church member that gave me this flat, um, of which I only needed to pay the levy, and. I had my reasons why I decided not to take his help anymore. And so I moved back to Bloberg in the big house that used to be a guest house with many rooms. I mean, this house looked like a mansion. It was ginormous. And uh, it had a lot of rooms. And everything in this place was big. Um... But I'm sure there are places that are bigger, uh, much bigger. But it's the biggest house I've ever lived in. And uh, <clears throat> I went back to the exact same room that I had before I went to Milneton. So it was like a reset button. I went back to the be beginning. But this time around... My ex that I had broken up with for about a year and a couple of months had already moved out and started a new life with his new girlfriend, already had a baby with her, a little girl. And so when I moved in, he wasn't there anymore. And some of the friends that I had before, whilst I was staying there before, also had moved out. Um, there was only one family that... I recognized that was still staying there that new spark um, and on me coming back to this room I was still going to the first church um, that I started my journey in my relationship with Jesus and during my time in Milneton, when I was staying in the flat, there was, towards the end of the, the period of me staying there, it was the first lockdown for the coronavirus, and we were at home. We couldn't go to work. We couldn't do anything. So we were at home. We were homebound. But when I was staying in this room now, back in Bloberg, um, I was church hurt. I discovered that people in the church were having bribes, getting together during lockdown, but not once did they invite me. Um, and it kind of hurt that they were getting together and just like excluding me from everything. It made me realize that I actually made, hadn't made any friends in this church 
um, which was the first church I went to. Um, it was also the church where I got baptized for the first time because I got baptized twice. Um, and I discovered, I discovered that these people were gossiping about me. They were backbiting. They were talking down about me behind my back. I even felt them like talking down about me and gossiping in my presence, but like in code, as if I'm too stupid to know that they are doing that, um, which hurt. And I remember it was my 40th birthday and I wanted to celebrate it because it was the big 4-0. And growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, we were not allowed to celebrate our birthdays. So now, now having become a, a believer uh, in, Christ, in, in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, and, and being a Christian in this first church that God had placed me in, I wanted to celebrate my birthday. And I wanted it to be... I wanted to invite everyone in the church to come to Kirstenbosch uh, Gardens to have a picnic, to walk around and enjoy the trees in the garden and to bring your own picnic just to enjoy God's nature and do a bit of singing for the Lord, have a small message and just fellowship um, and to and to celebrate my life that I was born into this world that God created me to be a part of his creation because that was not something I was allowed to do growing up as a child and I'd never had a big birthday party not even my 21st, not my 18th birthday, not my 16th birthday. I don't know what it is to have a big birthday party. Um, I, I've never experienced that in my life. I don't even know what it is to have a proper wedding. So... I did have a wedding, but it was not a proper one because everybody that came to my wedding in my first marriage, which I'm divorced from, was all my ex-husband's family. Nobody personal to me except my mom. So I don't know what it is to be surrounded by people that love me, that, that I've built relationships with, that I can call my family and my friends. And I was trying to reach out to the people in this church to, to be that family for me because I've always had a desire to have a family because my own family has rejected me. Um, in this uh, period of my life, I had no relationship with my mom, no relationship with my, my brothers or my sister, sisters, sorry, um, and just been cut off from my aunties and my uncles and I just don't have family. So I don't know what it is to have that family set up and to be worthy of a family, to feel valuable amongst a community, to feel valuable in a group of people um, to connect like in nature you have a herd of um, sheep you have you have a herd of you have you even have a flock of birds you have a swarm of bees but I never found my flock I never found my my herd or my swarm or whatever you want to call it I've always just been a loner I've always just been on my own and um, in this period of my life I had all this drama 
with Spark. And the church looked down on me for that. Um, and some of them condemned me for it because uh, some of the people was gossiping, saying that I did steal Spark from his first wife. Um, but I never knew that they were married. They'd been separated for two years. And I, I was already pregnant, and only then did the truth come out that they were married. But um, it's, it was like this gossiping in the church that I'm to blame, that I went and interfered in, 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 a, in a marriage on purpose, and got pregnant on purpose with a married man. And yes, I did hold on to my family, and I didn't want to let go. And I didn't want to um, give Spock back to his wife at the time, of which they did get divorced during our relationship. Um, and I did ask her to forgive me, this ex-wife, because now when I look back, I can see that I should have just left them to sort out their marital problems, even though I was pregnant, even though... I had Spark's baby. I should have left them alone. Even though I had this desire to have my own family. And I felt like this was my last chance to have my own family with a mommy and a daddy and a child together. And I did tell Spark, this is my last try. In making it work with a man. So if it doesn't work with the, with you. I don't want another man again in my life. I just want to leave that alone. And carry on with something else. And little did I know that I was actually like. Prophesying what's going to happen in my life. Because that is how it is for me now. I don't have another man in my life. I don't want another man in my life. And I'm just happy to serve the Lord and to live for the Lord. And I've actually like kind of surrendered myself to Jesus, my life to him, because I that is my decision and that is what makes me happy now. So Anyway, so I had invited them for my 40th birthday to Kirstenbosch Gardens. I invited everybody in the church. It was a small church. It's the smallest church that I'd, I can say, formally went to every Sunday. Um, I'd never experienced maybe one other time a small church. Um now, one other time I did experience a small church, but it was, I don't know why it was so small, but a lot of people had fallen away from that church after lockdown. So maybe that's why it shrank. Um, but this church was very small, maybe just like, I'm, I'm not good with meticulous details, but I could say maybe just a hundred people going to this church. It could even be less than that. Um, and not one single person came to my birthday, not one, not even the pastor and the pastor's wife, nobody, nobody, nobody came. I went to Christian, Christian Bosch Gardens for my birthday and Nobody showed up, and I felt so hurt. I felt so hurt. I felt so church hurt. I felt so stupid for even thinking that people would come, and I felt abandoned. I felt like... There was something wrong with me that absolutely nobody could like me. I felt like I was 
And I was thinking to myself, it must be my my relationship with Spark. It must be. I started like analyzing the situation because I'm a very deep thinker and I like to have understanding. And so I just felt after that, like, maybe it's because I'm needy and I thought maybe it's because I'm poor and I don't have what other people have financially, um, I'm a single mother with two children. I thought maybe they don't want to hang out with me because I have children. I've just started to think like, what is it? What is so wrong with me that these people have decided they don't like me and they don't want to hang out with me? And they don't want to invite me to their bras or invite the, me to their home or even try to develop some sort of a relationship with me. So it just made me feel hurt. And it was the beginning of... later on deciding to leave this church like I don't want to go to this church anymore because after this church member did help me um, and he was an old man in his 60s um, with the flat in Milneton and I came back to Bloberg the church was gossiping about me again and saying that now I did come back to Spark, that I've taken him back. And that, that was not the case because Spark had already moved out with his new girlfriend, of which he already had a little girl with her and a new family. And so it hurt me that they would think of me like that, that I would interfere with somebody after they've already had a baby. It was not my intention to take Spark away from this new um, girlfriend because I've been there and I know that when you're ha having a baby with somebody, you want that person to, you want that boyfriend to stay with you. So I already knew from her side how it feels because of what Spark's ex-wife did to me trying to grab him back after you've already started a new family. So, and God had already told me I must leave Spark. Even though it took me so many years to leave him, it was a very difficult thing for me to leave him. But I did eventually get it right by the grace of God. He gave me the strength. Jesus helped me to let go. Because I couldn't do it by myself. I had to literally see Spark having sex with the landlady's daughter with her, with her on her back, hanging down the bed with him on top, busy having sex with her. I opened the door and when I saw that, I was able to let go of Spark. Even though I knew he was with other women and I knew he was unfaithful to me. I didn't want to I, I didn't I didn't I still couldn't let go of him. But when I saw it with my eyes, I was able to let go of him. And I think God allowed me to see it with my eyes to, so that I could let go. Because God knows us better than anybody. Jesus knows our frame, knows our inside, our outside, knows everything. And 
It was what I needed to see. I needed to see it, not just hear it, not know about it. And um, that helped me to let go. So I thank Jesus that I actually walked in on them and saw that. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically this uh, part of my testimony um, is explaining how the church uh, let me down. But they also had their moments where they were there for me. Um, my cell group leader, uh, that couple, they did, they did pay um, my rent after I left Spark. I think about three times. Um, I can't remember the meticulous details, but they did pay my rent about three times. Um, that is how they did help me financially um, through this process of this hectic breakup. Um, and what people don't understand in that church is that I had been scarred. I had been hurt. I had a lot of hurt inside of me that hadn't healed. And when you're in such an abusive relationship, it's very hard to come out into the society again. It's very hard to get integrated into the community again and to function as you did before. I mean, I was a very strong, independent woman before I met Spock. I had my own cottage. I had a vehicle. I was... Uh, earning a, a, a fairly good salary. Um, I was pretty independent doing it on my own. Um, but then after having met him and falling pregnant with him, like the first time we had sex, and my boss firing me when he found out that I was pregnant, and then becoming dependent on him, and then having to be in this kind of dependency of somebody that now unravels the the other side of him, the dark side of him that's monstrous and so abusive. The level of abuse was so severe emotionally. And there was a little bit of physical abuse, but the emotional abuse was more deep cut. And then having to leave him and just go on as normal like I did before was a, a real struggle for me because I, I was crippled. It's, it's like somebody who had broken their legs and now they must walk. Um, and so that this church had no patience for this. They had no understanding. They, they could not relate to why I was struggling with this because they could see this bad was this man was terrible and they can't understand why I want to be with him why I can't leave him and then when I do leave him why am I struggling to stand on my own two feet and um, God had given me a new course in Korea because I was a beautician and then from there, I became a great art teacher in a daycare. And um, this job gave me such joy and purpose. And I remember doing this job that I, I discovered something new about myself. And I, I was like, this is the job that I love. This is the job that I love to do. This is what I'm passionate about doing. I, ne I could never say that about any other work that I've ever done. I was happy to get up in the morning and go to work. I would even prepare things on the weekend for my classroom. And I had such a fondness and love and um, compassion for my children. And I loved being their carer. But the thing that I loved most of all was the Bible study in the morning where I was teaching them to pray, teaching them to talk to God, teaching them to, to make him 
their friend, teaching them the word of God, explaining the Bible stories to them, praising the Lord, singing to the Lord, learning new songs, dancing for the Lord, doing dances for the Lord. Um, it was just, I was in my element and I felt like I'd stepped into my design, the way God had created me. Like a kettle is designed to boil water. I felt like I've just stepped into the perfect design and makeup that I was created for. And that was to be a carer of children, to teach them, to be a teacher, to be a carer of children. I mean, when they vomit, I clean up the vomit. If they mess their pants, I clean it. Um... Wiping their faces, cleaning their snot. Just those other things that come with being in a daycare. And putting them to sleep during nap time. Singing to them. Uh, it just, it's, it's a different kind of teaching environment to a formal classroom in a big school. Because you have these other little things that you do for, for the children during the day. Because they are, they are more dependent on you. Because they are so small. They're still very small. Um, and that bond with them, the first time they get it right to write their name. Or the first time they get it right to count to 100. And that achievement between you, the teacher, and the learner. And I just found something that gave me a purpose in life to wake up in the morning and go live my purpose for that day but this job does not pay I mean my salary was four five my rent is four seven and I'm sure you can do the math how am I gonna eat I must still pay bus fare to get to work. I must still pay the balance of my rent. And so I was always like needy and dependent on other people to survive. And the church, my first church, did not like it. On top of everything else, I was studying because I had to do some learning for, for the daycare to get certifications. And... Um, so on top of that, I'm working, I'm studying, I have assignments, and uh, it's a lot. It takes a lot from my time. I had no, not much um, time because this church was saying, why don't you do another job? Why don't you do two jobs? Why don't you do something for an e extra income? And I felt that was so unloving because I'm already working and, and studying. And my job is full day. It's not like other teachers. And I'm not saying other teachers have less work to do because they take their work home. But in a big school... The children go home. They're not with the children the whole day. They can have a break from the children in the afternoon and focus on their lesson plan or whatever they do their marking. But they're not constantly all day with the children. Whereas in a daycare, you have long hours that you spend with children. And then you get home. I mean, some of the daycares, I had to be there at half past six and then still leave after six in the evening. That's more than 11 and a half hours a day of working and not even being able to take a lunch break because you have to be at a 24 hour. It's like, it's not a 24 hour job, but children is like, you have to watch them all the time. And I didn't have an assistant to help me. So now you want me to also have a second job and study because you don't want to give me financial support. And the, the reason why I'm voicing this is because I need uh, 
the society to be alerted about what daycare teachers go through. They are not independent, but they are working. And they are still needing other people's support and help, even though they are working. And I think it's really unfair because this job also requires you to have skills and qualifications. So even though you're skilled and qualified, your salary can start from 2,500 Rand in 2024. I think that's like probably the lowest paying job out there. And I think it's absolutely unfair and something needs to be done about it. There needs to be some sort of solution because a lot of times um, what I'm finding is that the principals, because they have their own business, they still want to make a profit margin. They want to be motivated to have a daycare. They want to benefit from it. Um, so they can't afford to pay daycare teachers or daycare carers a proper salary. If you only have five children in your class, how's the principal going to pay a rent and profit and pay the teacher? Because you don't always have a lot of children in your class. Some children, I've had a class with, where I've had five children in my class for a season. I've had a season where I had children in my class um, uh, going like 15 children. I've had a season where, where I've had children in my class that went up to 28 children without a assistant. Now, whether there's 28 children in my class or 10 children or 15 children in my class or five children in my class, I'm still getting the same salary. So it's like, I'm not going to pay you more because you have more children in your class. I'm going to pay you the least amount of money for the least, for the probability of you having five children in your class, which is not always the case. As like a safety measure for them. Because once they're up your salary, how can they down it again after that? And I don't know... I would suggest that the government be re fully responsible in paying daycare teachers and not putting any responsibility on the principal because where there's support elsewhere, maybe an extra thousand or extra 800 rand a, a month, um, it's like the, the principal now decides to pay you that amount less. It can happen. So you're still getting jinxed. Uh, uh, as a teacher, you're still getting crooked. And there needs to be some proper, proper measures in place where the daycare teachers not get crooked out of their money. I know uh, of a principal that got support from the government to pay the teachers, but she didn't pay them what they were supposed to get because she was keeping the money for herself. She, she only gave a, a, a small, tiny raise, a couple of hundred rand extra. Um, and how's that going to help your 2,500 rand to live a proper life, to pay rent in a, a proper flat, to have your own car, to buy food, to buy clothes, to support your children, to be independent because you have a skilled, qualified job as being a carer of children. And we need to take, we need to give these um, carers value for looking after your children who are valuable. When you're at work, making the money to pay rent for your own flat, to be able to drive your own car. Why is it that the parents can live in a flat and drive a car, but the teacher is not allowed to because she's live, she's working in a daycare, and people are looking down on people working in a daycare, thinking that is like a that is like a a loser's job. That's like a useless job. Why 
like we're looking down on you because you you are looking after children as if to say you are not a very uh learned or very quali uh you're not a very like, uh, clever person to be to be able to look after children because anybody can look after children and that is not the case because even a person that is in a daycare needs to be skilled trained has to go for qualifications has to um no first aid um and all sorts of things to be able to take care of your child who is valuable to you and to be able to give the best care for your child does require some qualification and training so i don't know why people think so little of people who are working in a daycare i've had people come up to me and say to me why don't you seeing that you're not getting paid enough in the daycare, why don't you just go get a job in a big school and become a teacher? And I'm saying, why must I do that? If I like working with smaller children, if I like being in the daycare, so I must change what I like and the class that I like to work with for bigger children, not that I'm saying there's something wrong with bigger children, but I like the setup of being with the little ones. And why must I change that to suit a different type of classroom and a different type of need from me when I like the, what I'm doing in the daycare. I like that I'm doing Bible study in the daycare. I like that I have that opportunity to do that because in a big school, they don't allow you to give Christian input in your classroom. And some of these daycares that I, that I worked in are principals that are Christian, that are happy to give the Christian input in their daycare. The parents are Christian of the children that I am giving that spiritual food every day and the parents love it that i'm doing this for their children because they're too tired to do it at home after a day's work to sit and do bible study with their children after they've been cooking and doing this and that they want to relax and they're happy that their children is getting this every morning from me because it's part of their faith it's part of their their belief system and then there's also parents who are not going to church that have thanked me for teaching their children about Jesus because they still want their children to know Jesus even though they are struggling with their relationship with Jesus. Some of these parents have drug addiction, alcohol addiction, whatever reason. Um, maybe they are in a relationship with somebody that they can't get married to or maybe they are just, for some reason, have pushed God aside and, and they're not able to go to church. They, emotion, they feel like they can't go to church because they are struggling with their own relationship with Jesus, but they still want that for their children. So those children who can't get to church on Sunday is getting it with me. So why must I give all of that up to go work in a formal school and be denied that opportunity to do that every morning? Because going to a formal school, I have less freedom to do that. And to do that consistently every day with the same children has more of a positive effect over the long run. I've seen a transformation in children where I start with them in the beginning of the year and at the end of the year there are a big change has happened in them because it's consistent. It's every day. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's consistent. They are consistently getting the spiritual input in their life in the morning and this is what drove me and gave me the passion to be in the daycare but now I'm not getting the money I need 
Now I must go to the church and ask the church for food. And this church, this first church that I went to, was not happy with it. There were some, uh, after this church member who helped me with the flat in Milneton stopped helping me, this church didn't want to help me. And so I left that church. I hadn't made one friend there. The only friend that I ever made in that church was Jesus. I made friends with Jesus in that church. And I think in that church, I found Jesus. I made friends with Jesus. And it took a period of time. It was a process for me to let go of spark so i was able to do that in that church and finally leave him um but now i'm still not independent still dependent on somebody to help me so now i find myself going to another church uh it was a pretty big church a very spiritual church um much bigger than the first church that I went to. And I was so church hurt. I was, and I said to Jesus, I'm not going to ask this church for food. Look how this other church treated me because I need food in my home. And yet I'm not even lazy. I'm still going to work and I work hard. I have to clean my classroom. I, there's other things I have to do. I have to be a cleaner, clean windows, clean floors, clean tables and chairs, clean mats that they sleep on. I'm also a cleaner and a teacher and a minister because I do the, the Bible study with the children. And, but I, I get treated like, like a problem in that church. Not even grateful for the progress that I've left this man, that I'm making progress in my relationship with God. They just expect me to heal and be better. And they can't, the worst counselors, the worst, they, they, they don't know how to counsel. And I just feel like, yeah, so when I came to this new church, this new church, much bigger, more impersonal, um, but very, um, conscious of wanting to be personal they want to to develop this community in culture they want to develop a community culture in in the church they are striving for it they have a ambition for it um but my personal experience with it um they have the vision but they still failed me in the long run so, um, but I will talk about that church in the, uh, yeah, I'll see how, how does it go. Um, anyway, so I was going to this new church and then I was still visiting Spark and his new girlfriend with a new little girl that was born. Um, having knowledge from lockdown. And being in Milneton, now staying in Bloberg, I have the knowledge that Cyclone, Spock's eldest son, had been raped by a man who used to fetch him from school and first take him home, before taking him home, um, that man had already been locked up in a jail. Not because Cyclone testi testified in court, because he didn't want to do that, but because there were other people... This man was doing it to other children that he was doing it to. And so because of their testimonies or because of the investigation regarding that, they, they had enough evidence to, to lock this man up. Um, what I discovered was that during this investigation, Cyclone confessed about his uh, repeated again that um, about the event of his grandpa touching his private part in the changing room of Pep. His Spark's brother 
I'm making him do oral sex with him. Uh, making him watch porn, giving him dacha at the age of like, I'm not sure, I think it was six or seven. I'm not sure about meticulous details. So you can imagine how young this child was. Um, and that was around about the time he got raped as well. And then also confessing that his own dad, Spark, had um, molested him in the bath. Uh, at numerous times when they both, uh, it happened constantly over a period of time. And also that something happened in the bed, him rubbing his leg and made him scared. And I don't know, some, this child is not very, um, doesn't really want to, to talk about his dad. Um, and so I was really worried about leaving my little boy with Spock having all this drama with Cyclone and all those confessions and things, this other man even got locked up because if he's telling the truth about that man, then he must be telling the truth about every, everybody else because he just decided to get it all of his, off of his chest and, and told the police. So now I'm still in the situation where I am staying close to Cyclone because, I mean, uh, Spock and his new girlfriend and their new baby and he wants to see his child and I must take him to see his child but at the same time I want to protect my child so I go to protect my child not to get in their relationship or in their business, but I'm actually there to protect my child. And when I go there, I get hurt because at the same time, regardless of everything I know about Spark and everything that is done wrong to me, I still have a love for him. And that is the kind of love that Jesus has for us. Jesus still loves us. Jesus doesn't like the things, some of the things that we are doing because it's ungodly, it's unholy, it's wicked, it's, it, it falls short of his holiness because Jesus is holy. So when we do something that's not holy, he doesn't like it. But that doesn't change the fact that Jesus loves us. So I could relate to that kind of relationship with Jesus because I was asking myself, why do I love him? Why do I love him when he's done all these terrible things to me and been so abusive to me? And at the same time, I even know that he's got this pedophilic tendencies, but I still love him no matter how terrible he is. And uh, so Jesus did reveal to me, but I also love him. I also love Spark. I also don't like these things that he's doing, these ungodly things, unholy things that he's doing. But I also, also love Spark, just like you love Spark. But Jesus still wanted me to leave him because Spark was bad for me wasn't good for me because Jesus also loves me and wants me to be healthy and, and, and healed. And Jesus wants me to heal and, and be, be everything he, that he wants me to be. And I can't be that if I'm in this relationship. I can't step into the perfect will of God when I'm in this relationship because this relationship is crippling me emotionally. It's scarring me. I'm getting hurt. Even though you can't see the scars, it's inside. And so I said, okay, Jesus, but I still need you to deliver me from this man. Because look, I have to take my child to this man. And when I take him to his house, whilst I'm sitting there, I must monitor and look. And I don't like it because I'm even scared for my child to sit on his lap 
or to go swim in the swimming pool with him or do anything with him, I have to be there. I have to be by the swimming pool. I have to be there when he's, they're sitting, watching a movie. I have to be there. I'm trying to protect my child from not getting molested. I have no proof because Cyclone didn't testify in court. He didn't testify of anybody, not even the man who got locked up. But all this information is there. And with this information and knowledge, I need to protect my child. And uh, so I ask God, you have to deliver me. You have to deliver me from this situation. I would pray to the Lord and ask him, take me away from Bloberg. Take me away from this place. Take me away from Spock. Take me away from his, his girlfriend. Take me away from everything. Take Take this little one that I have with Spark. Take us away. Deliver us from this situation. Because I can't keep on going on like this. I go to work. I come home. Everything's fine. But then I have this thing in my life that I have to go visit Spark. I've broken up with him. I've been broken up with him for a year and a couple of months. But I must still go visit him. And I need to get over this relationship because I'm still getting hurt by it. I need to move on. It's not nice watching somebody you love having started a new family, a new life. It's so hard. And having to smile and be friendly and polite and still put myself through that because I want to protect my child and Knowing I don't want him back, but it still hurts. And so, as I was praying, I was like, God, deliver me. Deliverance, I need my deliverance. Deliver me from my captivity. Because even though I've made the choice to leave this man, I'm, and I've left him, I'm still in captivity. I'm not even with him anymore. And I'm still in captivity because of this man. And... Uh, Then the one, uh, then what happened was okay. Besides that side of it, uh, at the work side, I'm now at this new church. The other first church doesn't want to help me with food. I'm at this new church. I'm still struggling with food. The spark doesn't help with anything financially. He said to me, "You don't give me sex, so why should I give you money?" Even though it's to support his child. He doesn't want to give anything. So that's the attitude that he had when I was with him. And that's the attitude that he had after I broke up with him. Um, I stopped having sex with him when I got baptized and gave my heart to Jesus. Even though he had been cheating on me before, during and after. He couldn't handle the fact that I rejected him in bed and he was still holding a grudge against me for that um, and so I got no financial support from him then the people were saying to me at the church why don't you go get maintenance why don't you go to the government why don't you go to courts and I'm like no I don't want to fight with this lion I don't want to fight with him because he's a pedophile. And what if he wins in court and has a right to have my child sleep there and then gets his visitation rights and now my child is allowed to sleep there even every week? I was like, I'm not going to court because I did not trust the court. I feel like the court has failed me in the past. I feel like the court will fail me again. I feel like the court has failed Cyclone. I feel like the government has failed this little boy. I don't have no trust in the courts. I don't believe in the courts. The court has failed me 
when my mom was getting beaten up as a child and I was watching my mother get beaten for years and the court failed me when the police told me there's nothing she can do for me she said to me this was not happening to me it was happening to my mom and so only my mom can lay charges against this man for for beating her but I was witnessing the beating I was hearing her cry I was hearing her screaming out of panic and fear and terror I was hearing her cry and scream out of pain I was hearing I was seeing her getting knocked out and laying on the floor unconscious I was seeing her getting strangled I was seeing bruises on blue eye strangled marks on her neck marks on her body and the police didn't help me the court failed me so why must I trust the court now with maintenance how can I trust the court now that they will protect my child from a pedophile that Cyclone has confessed his dad is doing this to him but Cyclone won't make that confession in court so how does that keep me safe how does that keep my, my child safe and now you as a church is telling me knowing all of this because I've told you this you want me to go get maintenance if that man pays maintenance for my child then he's also going to have rights to visitations and what proof do I have that he is, is in fact, a, a pedophile? What proof do I have besides what Cyclone has confessed, besides the report Cyclone made to the police station? And so, I was frustrated with this church not understanding my situation not supporting me but now I was in a new church still struggling to eat and I was in the classroom I have no food I'm hungry my child is hungry so what I started to do and I'm not proud of this. I'm very much ashamed. I did ask God to forgive me. Whatever the children didn't want to eat from their lunchbox, because they got the this principle said to the, the, the parents, we don't cook, we don't have a kitchen, we don't have a license to cook, because you need a certificate for a kitchen in a daycare. So the parents would bring a lot of food knowing that the children is not going to get fed at school and so there was two tea breaks where they would eat from their lunch boxes and whatever they didn't eat I would eat it I would give it to my child and some of these children were very ungrateful or didn't really care for their food so I would eat it on top of it there's this thing about schools if you don't feed the children parents complain you have this not all parents but some parents will complain if food comes home so to avoid these complaints the principal likes it when the food is finished so that the parents don't come and complain and say why didn't my child eat today why didn't you feed my child why didn't you make sure my child finishes their food and then I have uh, another situation when I try and force feed the child, the child can vomit because the child is rejecting the food. It's too much for them because some parents are very caring and trying their best as parents. So they overcompensate the lunchbox and expect it to be finished. So I would eat, I would take it. And I was telling myself it's okay because if I don't eat it, I'm going to throw it in the bin to avoid a complaint. And... So why must the food go in the bin when I can eat it, when I can give it to my child? And so I was telling myself this and convincing myself that I'm doing the right thing. And um, then the one day I went to the cell group 
or the com or whatever you want to call it, where they'd have Bible study in the, in the middle of the week. And uh, there was a prophet there. And the prophet came up to me and I, I used to wear overall at, uh, in my first job, being a uh, new at this and everything. I was like, yeah, I'm going to even get an overall to protect my, my nice clothes because I expect to get messed on. Sometimes a child can burp or sometimes a child can, um, and I don't always have babies with me, but sometimes I could help with a baby during nap time or something. And so I, I was expecting to get dirty, so I wear an overall. And at this come, the prophet said, I saw you with an overall. And behind you was these big windows. And in my classroom, I had big windows behind me. And the prophet said, I see you eating big chunks of quality meat off of the floor. And Jesus is saying, come and sit at the table and eat with me. Don't eat off of the floor. Eat, eat by me. And so, um, I had to just put a light here because my camera slows down on my mouth when there's not enough light and it's raining outside, um, which is making the room dark even though it's daytime. So, um, I don't have the best quality uh, equipment to work with, um, but I'm doing these videos, so just please um, excuse me. So, when I was at this daycare, um, I mean, at the, at the uh, uh, Bible study uh, in, the, in the middle of the week, uh, this prophet told me, I see you, he had a vision earlier on in the, in the day and he saw me eating big pieces of steak, quality meat off of the floor. And Jesus said, don't eat off of the floor, come and sit at the table and eat by me. And I knew in that moment that Jesus was watching me in the classroom. You can see everything that's happening in the classroom and was watching me eat the children's food from the lunch boxes because we used to sit on the floor and eat because I didn't have enough plastic tables and chairs for them. So there was about, that was the classroom where I had up to 28 children. In my class, there was a lot of children, so there was a lot of lunch boxes. Um, uh, and I was alone, there was no assistant. So, and I had my little one with me in that grade R class. And um, so there was a lot of lunch boxes, a lot of food, and a lot of children who don't want to finish their food. And there's some things they don't like eating. And now Jesus is telling me, don't sit on the floor with these children and eat from their lunch boxes. And so I was like, so embarrassed. Even though I know Jesus can see everything, but to have that kind of like, Confront, confrontation, like Jesus talking to me through somebody, a prophet, telling me, stop it, don't eat the children's food. I felt so embarrassed, and at the same time, I felt so shocked, because the realization that God is watching me, He's there, even though I can't see Him, and, but that God also wants me to sit at the table and eat with Him, um, not totally rejecting me, still giving me an invitation to sit with him at the table. I did not understand what he was saying. And I went home and I was thinking to myself, I was just so grateful at that moment also that 
Jesus didn't tell them that I was eating the children's food at the school. Because that would have been even more embarrassing. But that Jesus had some sort of mercy for me not to tell on me and expose me to everybody. He only told the prophet what he wanted the prophet to tell me. And he knew that when the prophet tells me that, I would already understand exactly what that is about. Because it's the uniform that I wear at school. It's the overall I wear at work. It's the windows behind me. I would sit out on the floor at work and eat with the children on, from their lunch boxes. So everything was like the vision. And it was earlier, in the, earlier on in the day that the, the prophet had this vision, which was earlier on in the day when I was actually doing that at school, at the daycare. And so I, I knew, okay, that is what it is. And then I went home and I said to God, but God, how do you expect me to eat now? How am I supposed to sit at the table and eat with you? How is this going to work? How is this going to happen? How do you want me to do that when you know I don't have money to buy food? When you know all my money goes to rent? You know my situation. And I was frustrated and I was angry that this is what God expects me to do. And so I went to work the next day and I was like, okay, I won't eat. But I said to Jesus, I'm still going to give food to my little son from the lunch boxes. I'm still going to give for him because I cannot watch my child starve. But I won't eat from the floor. I won't eat from the lunch boxes. And so I just made this decision not to eat. And I was like, okay, if I die not eating, then I die. But at least I know I was obedient to God who spoke basically directly to me through a prophet. And so I was like, I better listen to Jesus. And then I went to church on the Sunday. And my cell group leader or my Bible, Bible study leader, whatever you want to call it, from the group that we go to once a week, visiting his house and doing Bible study from his home, and not from church, but from his home. That leader, um, that uh, leader asked me at church, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And he said, can I organize you a food parcel? And I was like, yes, please. And I hadn't asked the church. This man just came up to me and offered it. And so he made arrangements for me to get the food parcel And I was sitting there and I was, and he said to me when he gave me the food parcel, it's like a, a it's like a voucher that you can get from, I think, checkers. And it was about 800 rand on that voucher a month. And I was like, wow, food, I can buy food. And I was sitting there and he gave it to me and he said to me, don't worry about it. If it's a year or two years, you will get this voucher for as long as it takes, for as long as you need it. And I was like, wow, is this like for real? Am, am I hearing things? Am I actually in a church that's going to support me and understand that I am working, but I don't earn enough money to, to, to buy food? And uh, so... Then, after getting help from this church for about six months, they, they started to get annoyed with me. Because why am I still needy? Why am I still not independent? 
I'm a grown up. But why am I still like a child that needs help? Like when am I going to grow up for real? When is this grown up going to grow up? Even though I'm studying, working very hard, doing a, a good job in my classroom. Doing the work that I'm designed for, that God has made me to do. And that's why I'm, he's, he's even given me the anointing to do it. I'm very good at my job. Um, but I get treated like I'm a teenager that's never grew up and doesn't know responsibility and can't get on her feet and is just totally useless and now burdening the church and burdening the church members and taking from them now because it's their money that has been contributed to the church that she's eating off on this voucher. And she's just taking advantage of the church. She's actually just uh, a leech. And I and I, I, feel that. I know that's what they're saying about me. And they don't like me. They don't want to invite me to their home. They don't want to invite me for their bride's. They don't want to invite me anywhere because I'm needy and I'm poor. And so it's just like, okay, they're, they're starting to get irritated. I can start seeing the change. In the beginning, they like me and then after a while, they switch. Then they don't like me anymore. And you can see when the change is happening. And so <clears throat> what happened, um, God spoke to me. I heard God speak to me. He spoke to me. His Holy Spirit was speaking to my spirit and told me. He told me through a dream and he spoke to me. So God wanted me to move from that big house with another Christian lady and go stay in her garage. So the rent will be cheaper and I can have a little bit of money to just try and get something to eat. So after I paid her rent, I would have a 500 rand left for food after having paid for the bus fare to get to work. But at the same time, God wanted me to move from the house. God wanted to, me to move my job to the house where I was staying. So I must move out of the house, but I must move my job into the house because that house also had a daycare. So I must move out of this house, but my job, I must move into this house. And I was like, how is this going to work? God told me I must move. And so I moved. I moved into the garage. After staying in the garage, uh, before even moving into the garage, God was telling me, this is before I uh, knew for certain that I'm going to leave the job. God was already speaking to my spirit, telling me to leave this daycare. But God wanted me to take my things because I had... From leaving the, the flat in Milnerton to staying in a small room. And also because of my heart, I did have some things like the TV, the big screen TV at the daycare where I was working. I had my desk, my teacher's desk. That was actually mine that I brought. I had actually done up that whole classroom um, with the help of the church member that gave me the flat in Milnerton. In a season where he was very giving. 
But now I, I must take some of the stuff back. I must take my puzzles. I must take my some of my resources. So uh, God is speaking to my spirit that there's going to be a change in my work. And so when I moved, I did move also a lot of my things out of the school. And my principal was suspicious. She was looking at me like, what's going on? And I didn't know where I was going to work. I wasn't even looking for work. I'm not very good at looking for work. I wasn't even putting my CV out. And then I had a dream in the morning. And God showed me a traitor in this daycare because this daycare, the principal and I had the same understanding of the Holy Spirit, but her ex-husband and their children were going to a church where they didn't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And those children wanted to get rid of me in this daycare because they did not want me to teach the children about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were not happy with my Bible studies. They were not happy with the way I was doing praise, praise and worship and praying and doing Bible study with these children. And so they were doing everything in their power to get rid of me to make me out to be a bad teacher, to be a bad carer, not doing the job properly. And they were constantly complaining to my principal and had managed to, at some stages, uh, to motivate her. They would managed to convince her that uh, I mustn't do Bible study. And this is the challenges I was having in the daycare, but I did continue the Bible study. They did move me from the grade R classroom to a uh, uh, three to four year class, thinking that those three to four year olds are too young to, to listen to Bible story. Sorry. But I did still do the Bible study with the three to four year olds. I still taught them how to pray. I still did praise and worship. I still did everything what I did before. And... This classroom was inside the house where the other one was at the back of the house. The great art class was at the back of the house. This class was inside the house. And now being inside the house, I was praising. I was teaching the children to praise, to lift up his name. I was, I was um, doing the Bible study. The Holy Spirit was leading me to the message. And whilst I was doing the praising part, I could see the children getting stiff. And walking like upset because now I'm still doing this Bible study inside the house. But the mother, she didn't stop me because it's like God was like stopping her from stopping me, giving these children spiritual food. And um, that morning i had a dream about the, the traitor that was the root of the problem causing all the children to come against me causing the mother to come against me she was actually the mother's brother's daughter and uh, in my dream god revealed that she is targeting me that she is the one who is my enemy. A friendly enemy, but not too friendly because when she comes home from school, she can't greet me. And the other child can't greet me. I'm an adult, but you can't greet me when you're coming home from school. And uh, so I always knew that these children had a problem with me. And... Uh, I had the dream that morning and God was showing me that uh, in this dream that I must leave this school. So after I had the dream, there was a cake in the dream. And the way that the dream portrayed everything during the course of the day, what I dreamt that morning, what happened that day happened 
as it happened, what I dreamt in the morning. So I already dreamt what was going to happen that day. And after I saw that, wait a minute, this is what I dreamt this morning, and it's happening in the class, it's happening in this daycare. I had dreamt it this morning, and now this is exactly what's happening in the daycare. I clicked, and I was like, this is a message from God. And then God, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and explained and gave me uh, an interpretation of the dream. And I was able to understand what the dream meant. And it meant that I must leave. And then in the afternoon, I was busy doing filing, filing the children's work and their files. And then there was something that was coming through from the TV whilst they were watching TV. And this thing that was coming through from the TV was confirming that I must go. Because whilst I was filing, I was praying. And I said, just one more sign, just one more sign, God. Because, you know, you're asking me a big deal now to leave this place. And then I got another sign that I must go. When I got home that day, because I hadn't yet, I was going to move out. I had, I was ready to found the, the, the garage, already know I'm moving, but I still had to, no, I had, yeah, I was going to move out, no, I did move out, no, I was going to move out, I was going to move out, well, I can't remember the meticulous details, I think I did move out already, but it was already just the weekend, like, let's say I moved out on, on the Friday, Let's say I moved out on the Thursday and now I'm at work on the Friday. But I, I just moved out yesterday, but now I'm at work on the Friday. You know what I mean? Something like that. And then, God forgive me for any lies because I can't remember properly all the meticulous details. But I remember after that sign that I must go, I went to that big house. And the woman said to me, yes, now I remember what happened. So sorry. When I moved out, as I was moving my stuff out the one day in that big house, it was so hectic because the way I moved out, she was shouting at me, the landlady. She was screaming at me. She was verbally abusive towards me. She was swearing at me. She pushed me. She wanted to hit me, and then and then she, she pulled me toward her after I, I spoke to her, and I did, she didn't want to give me my stuff, she wanted to withhold my property, so I voiced that, and I said to her, listen, I'm not like your other tenants, if you withhold my property, you, we will have our day in court. I will go to the police station right now another way. I said something like that. And I was very like forward with her. And I said to her, and on top of it, you're swearing me. I will mention that in court. I will men mention that to the police station that you're verbally assaulting me. And then she was like, wow, why are you talking to me like this? You've never spoken to me like this before. Because I've always been very humble and submissive towards this woman. And... Um, then I just said to her, I'm actually looking for a job. I know I must leave my job, but I don't know how I'm going to leave it. Because I'm having a problem with my boss's children. They don't like me there. And they're trying to get rid of me. And I can't work there. So I was just straightforward with her. And then she said to me, but you can work for me. How can you just leave me, move out of this house and, and, uh, and forget about me. And I was like, what kind of a woman is this? Because you're fighting me, you want to hit me, you're swearing me. At the same time, you're telling me you don't want me to go. At the same time, you're telling me, why am I doing this to you? I don't understand this emotional um, outburst. And um, I also told her, listen, I'm moving because you won't allow my eldest son to come stay with me. Because I've been praying for my eldest son to come home. 
because they had left going the wrong side of life with the bad friends, not good friends, and I've been praying for him to come home to me. And then when he does want to come home to me, this woman says, no, you're not allowed to have another child in that room. Because when I, when I, when I told her I'm moving in, I said to her, it's for myself and my little one. So she said to me, you never said it's for yourself and your little one and your eldest son. So he's not allowed to stay here. And I think that is also how God was motivating me to, to leave that house. And, um, but now she wants me to work there. So it's like, okay, but God is also telling me. So I was like, yeah, okay, I now must leave this job. So I was like, then she said, come on Monday for your interview. Because I need to interview you with my husband. And I was like, okay. But now my stuff is already, now I'm, I'm able to move my stuff out. She's allowing me to move my things out. And uh, I have access to my room again. I'm moving all the rest of my stuff out. And uh, I went to go stay in my new place with the Christian lady and her children. And... Then the very next day is the Friday that I had that dream. And then everything happened as the dream. And then the afternoon when I was doing the filing, something was saying something through the TV, confirming while, whilst I was praying for another sign that I must go. So I was like, God is telling me I must go. And now I'm going to go see that lady about a job after work. So I went to the interview on the Friday night after work and this woman was not kind to me. It's almost as if God had hardened her heart because she said I must start on Monday. And I can't even give this daycare notice to leave. And I was like asking her in the interview, can I at least give a two weeks notice period for my my previous boss so that they can get another teacher and she's like no you start on monday otherwise i give this job to somebody else and i was like wow this woman is so difficult i was even thinking to myself she's not very loving towards me or considerate or caring because how am i going to get a reference from this this boss of mine if i don't give a notice and so that's exactly what happened. I didn't go back to work on Monday. I went to my new job. As per the dream God gave me, the message in the afternoon that I must go. And uh, I started my new job. And my old boss was highly upset, very angry with me for not coming back to work. And not giving her notice. And she said, I will not give you a reference. Because you left without giving notice. You just didn't even. Because after the interview, I told her I'm not coming back to work. And she was like, I am not giving you a reference. And she was absolutely upset with me for months. I tried to get this woman to forgive me. Because she's a Christian and I know that if you don't forgive, the Bible says, if you don't forgive, Jesus says, if you don't forgive, then I can't forgive you. And if Jesus can't forgive you, how are you going to make it to heaven? And I didn't want to be the reason for this woman not going to heaven. I don't want to be the reason that she, she can't forgive me. So I tried for months to get her to forgive me. And her daughter, after I started work at this new job in the big house, the big house that used to be a guest house, this big house that I can't seem to leave because if I'm not living there, I'm working there. And uh, I said to God, when am I ever going to leave this house? 
because it's got so many sad memories, so many bad memories from when I was with Spock staying there. And now I'm working there. And uh, that's in that daycare, there was only five children in my class, of which my little one was still with me in the grade R. And I, uh, I enjoyed having only like five children with me. It was nice compared to having up to 26, 28 children, such a small group. It was less uh, stressful and it had, I had less pressure and I was able to give more one-on-one -on -one attention for each child. I was able to um, help them learn faster and learn more things. And in this school, there was an abundance of resources. I mean, my principal loved shopping for her school, for her play group, I mean, for her play school, uh, daycare, and um, to do arts and crafts was nice because there was a lot of things she had all these shelves, all these little shelves going right up to the wall, from the one side of the wall to the other side of the wall, to the other side of the wall, to the other side of the wall, full of arts and crafts things, googly eyes, venue wire, color paper, paint, stencils, um, beads, oh, feathers, colorful feathers, um, black, a heavy-duty masking tape. It was a teacher's dream. It was lovely. And I was just like, wow, I don't have to worry about resources. There was even crayons. I was like, wow, it's the scissors. There's everything I need to do my job. And it's not coming out of my pocket. Um, not that I was even able to pay for anything in my previous daycare, but the the man that helped me set up my classroom, that buy everything for my classroom. And then when the resources got finished, it got finished. And I wasn't able to buy more stuff again. So then it was very limited in what I could do in the class. Um, but now in this class, I could go back to being creative with the children and doing arts and crafts and doing things with them because there's resources. And... Um, when, when my uh, new church found out, this leader of the Bible study on uh, once a week, found out that I had now moved and changed my job in the span of one like week. Like it was actually literally within a weekend. Because I moved in on the Thursday the Friday, I go for an interview, and I started my new job on the Monday. And then when I went to my Bible study on the in the week, they were like, he was highly upset with me, and he had finally gotten a reason to stop my food parcel. He said, "I'm not giving you the food parcel anymore because you didn't tell me you're going to get another job, and you didn't tell me you're going to move." We are accountable for you in this church. And because of accountability, you need to report to us. And first, seek counseling from us before you make any decision in your life. You were supposed to come and ask us if it is the right thing for you to get another job and move. And I was like, what? What kind of a counseling, accountability thing is that? Just because I'm poor? And needy doesn't mean I need counseling on making decisions in my life. I was listening to God. Jesus was talking to me. The Holy Spirit was talking to my spirit. I had a dream. I don't need, I don't need to go ask somebody if God spoke to me. I know God spoke, spoke to me. I know when God is speaking to me. I don't need you to tell me. Or to confirm with me if God is speaking to me. I don't need you to also have a dream to confirm that my dream is from God. I know my dream is from God. So, 
now I don't have a food parcel anymore from this church. But I am paying less rent for the garage of which I can pay for my bus fare. And I have a 500 rand left to, to buy food for the month. Which is at least something. I can get a bag of potatoes. I can get rice. I can make soup. At least something I can buy to eat for myself and my son. And uh, I was enjoying my new classroom. I was enjoying uh, my small group. And uh, then God spoke to me, but before God already spoke to me in the previous daycare, the first one that I went to, in a scripture, and showed me in the scripture during nap time, and I wrote it down. I think I even drew a picture, I can't remember. And... Um, God told me to change my name to Israel. Because I had been married, I got married and divorced from my eldest son, whose dad was a Muslim. And I had to have a Muslim name to marry him. And I had to have a Muslim name to convert, to become a Muslim. I had to be a Muslim in order to marry him. Not that I did care for the Muslim faith. I didn't say Surah to accept the Muslim faith. But I did change my name from my birth name to a Muslim name. And now I get a scripture in the Bible where God is telling me, you must change your Muslim name. And this is going to be your new name, Israel. And there was a river. And uh, there was other people getting a new name. Um, in the scripture, it showed that other people was also getting a new name. But my name is going to be Israel. And so I was like, wow, I'm going to get a new name. I must get a new name. And then I said to God, you need to give me confirmation. I need more signs from you to make sure that this is what you really want me to do. Because am I hearing you right? You want me to have the name Israel. Is this, am I hearing you right? I wrote the scripture down. I did everything. I prayed. And then after that, um, my son, my oldest son, was starting to visit me more. Um, I ha and I was happy that I'd moved from that big house where I was working to the garage because I was hoping that my son would move in because I wanted him to come home. Now, he came to visit me at my new place in the garage. And then we went to go get a small pizza to share because I wanted to do something to make him welcome. Even though I didn't have money to do this, I just forced myself to spend the money just to make him feel more welcome. And um, he landed up saying, if I can remember correctly, that he would pay for it. And he's like, no, I'll pay for it. If I can remember correctly, I don't want to lie about meticulous details, but I think that is what happened. Okay. Um, I just need to... All right. I just need to close off this video. Um, and continue with this testimony tomorrow 
um, I was interrupted during this video and so I wasn't able to um, complete it properly. Um, but what I can say is that God did give me a instruction to change my name to Israel through a scripture that I received in the Bible um, during nap time at the first daycare that I was at. And um, then I got a, when my eldest son came to visit me whilst I was staying in the garage that I moved to, staying with a Christian woman and her children. Um, that was now after I started working at the second daycare in the big house, at the guest house, um, that used to be a guest house. Um, when my eldest son came to visit me, he, uh, we went for a pizza. And I think he paid for it. I can't remember. If, and there was a competition to win a scuttle bra. And to enter this competition, you must write your name and your cell phone number and your email address. And I didn't know how to enter this competition, that that's what I must do. So I took one of the slips that was inside the Scottle Bri, little piece of paper, and I saw how somebody else did, did um, apply for the competition. It's like a raffle to draw and to see who's the winner for the scuttle bra. So they put the, the names of the people inside the scuttle bra. And I also wanted to enter the competition, but I didn't know how. So I, I checked how they did it. And I, when I opened, I just took one of the pieces of paper out of the scuttle bra as if it was a raffle. And I opened it, and when I opened it, I saw the email address starting with the name Israel. And I was like saying to my other son, look, it says Israel. And I said, wow, this is one of the signs that God is giving me to um, change my name to Israel. Um, then I said to God, I need another sign. I need to, I need another sign that you want me to change my name to Israel. So I said to God, thank you for this sign. And I started to get excited about this name. And so I was imagining, um, I said to God, one day when I get this name, Israel, I really would like to get a gold necklace with gold letters spelling my name, Israel, around my neck. And... Um, When I went to go see the Christian lady, the one day, this is one of the signs, that was before the scuttle bra, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I went to go visit the Christian lady about the garage, about the place to stay. And when I went to go see her, to have a meeting about my looking for a place to stay. Um, she mentioned another lady. She mentioned another place, but she said she doesn't really want me to move in there. She'd prefer it if I moved in with her. 
and that I stayed in the garage. But what took my, but, but what, what caught my attention was that she, it was Mother's Day and she was wearing a gold necklace with mom, with the, with the lettering of mom in gold. And her daughter had a gold necklace, a gold necklace with the lettering daughter. And they were wearing the same necklaces because it was Mother's Day. And then I was excited. I said, wow, God, you gave me another sign to change my name to Israel. Because I had meditated on and prayed to God saying that when I do get this new name, I would like a necklace like that. And now when I go see people about a place to stay, that was before I moved into the garage, I see them both wearing this gold necklace with lettering the way that I want my necklace. So I took that as another sign. And then after that, I got the sign with the Scottlebri. And then that the Scottlebri sign I got after I already moved into the garage. And then I got another sign um, at the daycare or it was a cartoon that I was watching, maybe not at the daycare, at the house where the garage was, where I was staying in the garage. Um, and it was a cartoon of a dolphin who got a name. There was a little boy that made friends with a dolphin and told the dolphin, your, your, your new name is going to be whatever. And the dolphin was so happy with her new name, she jumped up into the sky and wagged her tail and splashed the water and spun around. And she was really happy. And then the little boy said, wow, I can see you are really happy with your new name. And that just happened at a glimpse as I was passing the TV. And I thought, well, God, you really are talking to me because I take that as another sign. And then um, the Christian lady at the house that I was staying in the garage um, had by the desk where, or she, had, she gave me um, by the desk a dolphin to use as a paper plate a paper weight for the desk and I don't know if it was for her desk or for my desk because I also had a desk I can't remember meticulous details but when I saw that dolphin it reminded me of the cartoon and it was right next to my bed and I was like wow um, another reminder to change my name so I'm going to talk more about this on the next video because I need to close this video now <clears throat> but I can just briefly say that when I did tell the the Bible study leader that I I'm going to change my name, um, and God had told me to change my name. That same Bible study leader at the second church that I was going to that stopped my, my food parcel rejected my wanting to change my name to Israel, and he told me, that I'm not hearing from God, I'm hearing from the uh, from a demon or a devil or something, and that I'm not hearing the voice of God, and um, and discouraged me from changing my name, and and that in that church they they call it an accountability accountability. So everything you want to do in your life, you must get confirmation you must get permission um it's a very controlling setup and uh 
They were very upset that that I moved my job and moved my place to stay all in one week. And he didn't want me to change my name. He said, I'm not hearing from God. Even though I told him I'm getting all these signs and I believe God is talking to me. I've got the scripture. I've got this. I've got that. I've got this. He still said to me, no, you're not hearing from God. And he discouraged me and I felt so... Um, hurt that is telling me I'm listening to the devil and I'm listening to demons and that demons are talking to me and it, it, for, for a brief a brief moment in my life I was scared of hearing from God um, but I will continue this testimony on my next video um, and I thank you for watching I pray whoever um, is watching this that um, you not be discouraged to uh, go to church to find a relationship with Jesus um, that church be about Jesus and not the people in the church because you can get hurt by people in the church. And if they do hurt you, I pray that it will not be an excuse or a reason for you to stop going to church. Because the church is the body of Christ. And I pray that whoever is watching this that may have been church hurt, that they will be encouraged to go back to church. And that nothing will stop them from having a church service, church worship, uh, church um, messages from, from the Holy Spirit, and to be gathered into the flock of a church. In Jesus' name, I pray. I pray that they will come back to church and find fellowship among followers of Jesus, and I pray that whoever is watching this, that they will find the right church, that God will lead them to a church where they can grow closer to Him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching.